Hi, Garrett. Welcome to the show. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at Taxa Outdoors? I can. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Um, myself in the uh, two minute ish elevator pitch is I, I ended up founding Taxa. I was trained as an architect. I was being an East Coast architect. I sort of fell into a weird good timing. I had a friend that worked at NASA and I came down and visited her and uh, got introduced to a lot of people right at the same time that NASA was looking to start a new office. Um, and at that time, since now I'm old, I guess, it was right at the beginning of, this, of the space station and they wanted to hire non-engineers to uh, take a look at what was happening at NASA. Um, so I can go there forever mm -hmm. if you want to hear about that. And it's really cool, but right at the time they knew that a, a six month mission was really different than a up to two week mission, which is the switch from a, a shuttle flight to a space station flight mission. And that had to do, the shortest way to say it is when you arrive in outer space, you have about 16 hours of productive time. And after six months, you had about six or eight hours. Oh, wow. so, so where do those hours go? Uh, since that is science time and justifying to Congress time and all these things, where do those hours go? And how, how is quality of life or alleviation of stress contribute to make that, that inch up? So they were hiring a few architects, which means I got to call myself a space architect, which is really, <laughs> which is always really cool. And I always enjoy words and like the irony of like, I was a space architect before on earth, but now I'm an, an outer space architect, <laughs> but, but concerned about the inner space of astronauts brains and how they're functioning. Um, and then I, you know, I grew up being an outdoorsy East Coast backpacker uh, kind of cursing RVs as the things that I drove behind too slowly on highways. <laughs> and then I moved to Texas and it's like, oh, everyone has one. And I have small kids. And in fact, it, I guess sort of embarrassingly, like I want an air conditioner within three yeah. hours of Houston. Yeah. And, um, and then I thought, you know, but none, none of the RVs really speak, spoke to me in my lifestyle of being middle-aged athletic and like wanting to go outside and get muddy and dirty because that's the kind of guy I am. Um, and it's like, why is everyone making houses on wheels? Like, where is the athletic aspect of this? And then I thought more and more and more. Uh, and then I, I slippery sloped myself right into a business. Nice. Um, I spent a few years. I wonder if I should be saying this. Well, we can talk about that. I spent a few years before starting my own business uh, drawing some designs and presenting them to other manufacturers, you know, oh, specifically, okay. specifically Airstream because they have a super long history with NASA mm -hmm. and are so iconic and so famous and, and so cool culturally and in every way. Uh, so at first I said, I have a sexy resume. What's the 21st century? Um, and then even, I don't, and that's, so now I know Bob Wheeler pretty well uh, over the years, I've invited him to design reviews a long while back when I was a professor. And, uh, but that doesn't mean it worked out with Airstream. Yeah. And I got lots of initial founding. It's like, Garrett, you can't just show people a drawing. They don't get it. And then I also am convinced about that as a designer, that the, the, the way I design a house or a, or a habitat, um, it's like, how small can it be and how big does it need to be? Mm -hmm. Um, and that has a kind of performance aspect around it's like, because small is aerodynamic and fits in garage and small is enjoyably efficient and sustainable and arguably green and all these things. Um, but then how big it needs to be, it's like, it has to work. It has to work for big people and small people and old people and young people and toddlers who are using as a jungle gym and adults who are trying to drink a bottle of fine wine. Uh, and you know that's I'm a designer at heart, and uh, and always I'm a I'm a reluctant CEO, um, and <laughs> and wish I could always be designing the next product. I, I like that you call it a habitat instead of an RV or a travel trailer or something like that, um, I, because there is a definite difference between what you're manufacturing and what people think of as either a travel trailer or an RV. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a definite difference. And I'm glad you mentioned photographer because what, when I went on your website and watched all your, all your product videos, that 
I thought of a nature photographer uh, working out of the cricket, for example, as a, a perfect way to get way back in the country and, you know, just have a place to crash while they're out, at, you know, when they come back from shooting all day. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's, and retrospectively, since I, I, I can't give you like a percentage number of how many people take photography seriously who own our products, uh, but it's a good percent. And that's a fantastic genius, uh, you know, social media thing because people send us amazing cute pictures yeah. of their kids looking out windows at whatever, a bear. And you're like, this is perfect. Like it, it makes me want to cry in a middle aged way. Like my, <laughs> like that first paragraph of my business plan, it, it came true. <laughs> <laughs> where, um, where does the name taxa come from? Taxa, you may remember from ninth or 10th grade biology, the word taxonomy which is the classification of plants and species in a science way. Oh. And again, if I'm triggering memories and I can't do it right, it's kingdom, phylum, genus, order, species, something. It's all the Latin words. Okay. But, uh, yep. but, and I was starting an outdoor company and I like words and it's like, this is taxa short. It's the root word of taxonomy and any product I design, I can name after something in the outdoors. Oh, and, so that's, that's how uh, cricket, yeah. And then in a, I started with cricket and then all of a sudden I never intended to be insect focused. Um, okay. <laughs> but, but there is peer pressure after cricket to come back with the next insect and choosing an insect name is, is funny. Cause it's like, the, like mosquito or will like mosquitoes biting people be a bad connotation. And I, I don't know if mantis has the whole, uh, the female mantis eating the male mantis's head after sex thing. So it's a little scary maybe for kids, but, but finding friendly insects. And again, I'm a designer. I want the company to grow into other sorts of habitats too, or other products, because again, that design is my passion and fitting people and getting them outside. So if I design a folding camp table or something, maybe other categories will have, will be a, like a fox and a trout and a, a bird. But right now we are insects. <laughs> insects, okay. And that's, and then, sorry. No, that's the story. I was gonna ask you, who do you find as your first time buyers? Is it people that like you had mentioned? Is it the backpackers that are looking to get maybe? A yeah, it's, it's changing all the time. And I, I have this historical view of, of introducing a new product every few years. Um, so in a general way, our pro the four products we have are a family. So the mantis is the biggest and it sleeps for adult sized people. And which means generally we think that's a couple with two teenagers. Okay. Uh, we're agnostic about who you are, but that's, that was the idea. And a cricket is two adults and two kids and a tiger moth is two adults. And a woolly bear is not even in, technically an RV. Um, it's a cargo trailer that can be outfitted in a lot of ways, but we usually sell it with a rooftop tent. And so they're all gradations of comfortable camping. We never quite, I shouldn't phrase it that way. You know, again, we try to put the stuff that allows a camping adventure in there and not everything a house on wheels would be. And so you do have a very unique design, so to, so to speak, with the uh, exposed structures, mm -hmm. a lot of hooks for D-rings to hang hammocks, for example. Uh, yeah. how, did, how did working uh, with NASA affect that design that you created for your habitats? Um, a lot. It affected that a lot. But it, even before that, when I was in graduate school for architecture, I spent a lot of time uh, folding paper. And uh, so when I was originally setting out to design, I thought I should choose a method that's, you know, the latest in technology and CNC laser cutting and routing and um, stuff like that. But that, that lets me have a lot of freedom within one sort of system of folded panels to make any shape I want. Um, that is, you know, aerodynamic, but aerodynamic like a, a stealth bomber rather than a, you know, the super sleek Kirby. Um, you know, in a in a less practical way, I've never really worked with fiberglass, so I I didn't 
that wasn't how I started. But I was really thinking like, how do we use technology and the great vendors that are in and around the Houston area because of all the, there's a lot of great shops around here that have high tech stuff for the oil and energy industry. And that really using them helped me get into business. So that was sort of long winded. Um, the exoskeleton, endoskeleton, I could, I could make up a story that that was inspired by insects and I probably should, but uh, <laughs> really, really it was like, what system of construction will let me develop more shapes and make tweaks as I go along? Okay. Yeah, and it's such a unique um, design that it probably was difficult to manufacture that first vehicle. I imagine there were some challenges in that because some of the stuff that you're doing, I haven't seen on any other type of, of trailer. Uh, yeah, I, of course, I have funny stories about, funny war stories about the first ever cricket that left my first ever garage start off, the wheel fell off uh, <laughs> a few hundred yards away because the guy I was working with, for some reason, loosened all my lug nuts the night before. <laughs> Wow. Not, it, was, it was not sabotage and the wheel <laughs> fell off in the street and was headed towards the sidewalk in a hardware store. And I, it's like, in my mind, it was all a flash of putting on my hazards, jumping out of the car, trying to chase this wheel that slammed into a hardware store and a wheelbarrow and dented the wheelbarrow. <laughs> and I, I bought the wheelbarrow and threw it in the car with my tire put my wheel back on and drove away. And in my mind, it all took like 20 seconds of this life in slow motion. <laughs> like, this is a really bad omen, but, but it wasn't. I was advised not to put that on my Facebook page at the time. <laughs> wheel, That's probably wheel, good advice. <laughs> wheel falls off. You probably don't know this, but if you build a prototype trailer of your own, you have to take it to a police station so they can verify that you didn't steal it or you're not making it out of other people's parts and stuff like that. So that's mm. worth the trip was too. But, uh, and I thought, uh, you know, I sh should have gold plated that dented wheelbarrow and hang it from, from the ceiling. But really I found it so embarrassing for so many years that I, I saved it, but then I finally threw it out. <laughs> so you, did you, so you made it sound like you were starting, you started out in a garage, just your own personal garage. Um, well, I had a little architecture office and the space next to me was empty. And so for the first few years of thinking and designing, it really was the next space over was, I was taking all my architecture earnings and mm -hmm. building different versions of prototypes and building, uh, well, I should, when we design at full scale as quickly, as quickly as we can, something I learned at NASA, that if you're trying to be a small space, you really want to get people inside the space as soon as possible. So in addition to doing metal stuff, I built full-scale cardboard mock-ups of the first Cricut. Oh, cool. And then, you know, and then I put the coffee machine in the office inside it so that we all had to go in and out. We had to pass each other in doorways and the different size of us would have to sit at the little table and see if it worked because in a weird way that Architects don't know. I'm, I'm jumping all over the place. I don't know if it's confusing. You know, architects know a lot as they learn to design, but the smallest literal space you have to know is that a wheelchair accessible doorway is 36 inches wide. Okay. And that explains lots of clearances everywhere in your life, but also even the space that a, an oven door needs to open in front of the oven. But once you are able to go slightly smaller than that, all of a sudden, like 20 inches is much different than 21 inches. Mm -hmm. If you have like three bags of groceries and you're trying to go up a step and turn a corner, it's like that the table you're going to run your hip into shouldn't have a, a 90 degree corner. It should be rounded. And if you could taper it a little bit, maybe all of a sudden, just the, the choreography and how people move in the space is what you end up designing. And I think you have to do that by doing it and sometimes injuring yourself and hitting your head on things and, uh, you know, knocking your hip into things. And when I was a professor, I would make my students do silly experiments like that. Like, let's make the smallest story possible. And now you have to carry six things through it. And now you have to run through it. You'd like try running through it, two of you from opposite directions and see how big do you think, <laughs> how do you, th a door needs to be. 
So the design process is very much like that. Let's like, let's build one that's terrible and uh, start running people through it and let the, the people's actions define how the, the shape turns out. So from first pen to paper to uh, driving to that show in Salt Lake City, what was the time? Oh, yeah, I don't, two and a half years. Oh, that's like that. not, yeah, that's pretty quick actually. And, yeah, I mean, I, I had enough confidence that it wouldn't fall apart on the way there and back. <laughs> I was a, a little worried because I went to uh, that sh outdoor retailer has a show in, in the winter time in the summer. So I was driving through Wyoming in the winter in a trailer thinking, oh. how bad could this, how bad <laughs> yeah. could this be for me? <laughs> so when but you arrived, when you arrived at the show, uh, and that would have been, was it called a cricket at that time? It was, yeah. So was that your one and only cricket or did you <clears throat> build a few and you were bringing that one as a show and like a demo? Yeah, that was number two or number three. Number okay. one, in any good prototyping process, you should have broken number one okay. by, by testing <laughs> okay. it. So I broke number one really fast. Number two took much longer to break. I think that was number three. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And it's funny, the first time I saw a cricket at a show, I looked at it and then I looked at the name and you kind of mentioned this earlier, but I guess it's not true. Uh, in fact, that I looked at it, I was like, yeah, I could see looks like a cricket but i guess it really doesn't but the name no. seems to fit the shape um <laughs> yes well i can describe everything in the trailer in a sort of performance way but i'm also a designer and it's not accident that some windows look like eyeballs it's not an <laughs> <Okay>. accident <laughs> you know our graphics over the years have been influenced by uh, like cricket wing camouflage patterns just to make you know we're, we're small relative to the competition but even that you can break up outlines and uh, and make it seem smaller or more recessive. Um, and you know, part again, part of that was the insect inspiration. But part of that is that I've always wanted. Once our trailers are at a campground, you know, I don't want it. I don't want it to be like so obvious. I want it to be part like. It's like there's a cricket, like or there's an elk. It's like it's it's a totally big animal, yeah. But it's also it's not screaming out at you to pay attention. Um, so when I first started out, we made our trailers in two different colors, and it was red and green. And the press would always mention how uh, how we like we were bright. Everything else was white, and we were we were wow. green, oh, green and blue. Sorry, um, but really, I was like, if you're camping in a forest, like green and blue just sort of blend in with the sky you see through the tree canopy or the green of the leaves. And it was really trying to be not camouflaged, but, but natural. Yeah. But, but sure, I love that I can make our trailers look a little bit like bugs and creatures. And I think, I don't know how many people own their RVs. You might know, sorry, I don't know how many people name their RVs when they have one. A lot, a lot. Okay, all right. So <laughs> that's certainly true with, with our habitats too. Okay. And they don't tend, they seem to be people names more than insect names, whatever. <laughs> I don't know what you name an insect. <laughs> Did you have towing in mind when you, when you first uh, designed these? Because it looks like many of your models can be towed with a Jeep. Um, yes. Yes, again, so more of those systems before I even answer towing, it's like all our products, you may ask me about Overland Crickets, which might be an exception. They're designed to fit in a garage. You might not want it in your garage, but it, we're trying to design away the, the monthly storage fee that many people have mm. to pay. Um, and a Mantis just barely fits into a typical garage, but it, if you wanted to, it could. Um, so that's just another system. Yeah, all our tailors are designed to sort of weight goals. Um, and then, you know, we could be super high tech carbon fiber, everything, and just like, what is the most expensive, but what is the lightest trailer you can design? That's not really the point. If you make a big spreadsheet of every vehicle's tow capacities, there are a number of magic weights um, okay. that, that pop out relative to what is expecting to tow things. And so, 
the, the four cylinder things that tow things are like 1500 pounds or less. Mm -hmm. um, the exception, the biggest exception is like a, a Subaru Outback, which I think is currently 2400 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a few in the sort of 2400, 2200 pounds. And then the next magic weight is 3500 pounds, which is like every minivan plus a lot of the sort of smaller midsize SUVs. And then after that, it jumps to 5,000-ish. And, and you can, if I, if I had brought that spreadsheet, I could show you. It's really a graph. It's like, if you're selling a trailer that wants to be towed that weighs 1,100 pounds, there are eight vehicles that your customers are going to own. If, you know, once you get up to 3,500, it's like there are 40 vehicles. And at 5,000, it's, you know, 30 and it's all the, the bigger SUVs. So it's really designing to a, a target that allows people, because we like to think, we like to think that we've designed a tow vehicle purchase away from this lifestyle choice as much okay. as we can. Like as much as we can, we like to say, you probably already own your car. Like if you already own a, a big SUV, then you're more likely to be wanting a Mantis anyway. And so that works perfectly for that. You know, you can certainly tow a cricket. It's just, it's sort of a logic and a figuring out the system of what. So that's, that determines our GVWRs and our dry weights of our trailers. Okay. And it, oh, it determines many of our, many of our dealers, <laughs> many of our dealers uh, know who a taxa customer is before they even get out of the car. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's, it's one of these cars. And but they're getting out and they're wearing one of these brands of clothing, like we know right where to <laughs> right where to take them, um, which is cool. I, yeah. And you have you have four models, and you had mentioned the Cricket has the Overland Edition. What is different with the Overland Edition compared to the the, the standard Cricket? Um, it's it's the same body size and shape. It's it's largely suspension. So we switched to a Timberin suspension. Are you familiar okay. with Timberins? No, no, I am not. Sean. Timberin is a, it's an independent, it's an independent axle-less suspension. So it comes in two pieces that bolt on either side of your chassis. So you, you, it, it eliminates the crossbar or it raises the crossbar. So you get another three or four inches that way. And plus they come, so you get that ground clearance. Plus there's a four inch lift on that suspension. Wow. Okay. okay. So, you know, even further down a dirt road, or your yeah. your definition of dirt road expands. Yeah. Although it this is sort of an another side. The definition in different people's minds of what dirt road means varies a lot with the with the driver and even with the, the state you're in. Like how rutted is that word road gonna be? How dangerous? So I have to the caveat is like it's up to you. If you're going on an extreme road, be really careful and you it's not a mindless adventure the way driving on a highway is, or getting even to most state parks. I saw that you have a wireless brake controller on your, on your trailers, and I've never seen a wireless brake controller before. Is that something that you specifically look for? Did you guys design that? How did, how did you oh, find that product? No, that is not our product. That's made by a company called Auto Brake. Uh, and our desire to start including it on our our habitats uh, comes from what I was just saying that if you already own your tow vehicle and it has uh, having a wireless brake controller means that you don't need to have a, a seven pin hitch set up. You don't need to put a proportional brake controller under your knee up at the driver's seat. Um, and it, so to make it even easier to again, hope that they have, they already own their tow vehicle. Um, and it's, you know, if you own a, a bigger SUV or truck that has a brake controller built in, you know, it, it just bypasses what we've installed. But it's part of the trying to pre-think the logic. It's like, hey, if you don't want people mucking around in your engine and running a wire through, we, you can avoid it with this product. It was, is that standard or is that an option that you offer? Uh, no, that's standard on our three. The, the three, the woolly bear is always an exception. And it's, an, I mean, it's an exception in a regulatory sense too. 
because the bigger three you can get inside, they are legally vehicles or RVs. Um, the woolly bear is just a cargo trailer. So it, that means it can be sold differently. That can means it can be, hmm. it's a different animal. It's also okay. light enough that you don't need brakes, although we install brakes, but you don't need them in almost every state. Okay. Yeah. So from the time that you built your first one, and now I know you're sitting in the 2021 Cricket. I think I'm allowed to say that. Yes, you are. As you're changing things out, maybe changing specs, adding something like this brake controller, how much yeah. is that? How much of that is feedback from customer use? How much of that is just you guys scratching your head? How can we make things different or better or just more efficient? Oh, it's both. Um, it's both. Again, social media makes that uh, inevitable that you get a lot of feedback. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it makes it wonderful. We have a couple of users groups that uh, it's it's less that we're a part of, but we monitor and jump in when we have to um, that are, are fantastic. You know, our, our fans and our customers are our best advocates, but they're really inventive. And part of it is mm. like suggestions for changing details of our units. And part of it is genius solutions about how, you know, whatever, back to the professional photographer, where they hide their box or bolt it to the floor so that it can't get stolen or just how they, how they inhabit their habitat. Um, so, and then, you know, we're always on the lookout. It's the, what of course is not happening during COVID is that usually I would have gone to two or three rallies this oh, yeah. summer. And so that's sort of ego gratifying and fun because I'm the designer and the founder of the company and people get to talk to me, but, but really I'm there as a design spy to, uh, cause everyone shows their trailers and shows like how they cook, what types of meals and how, whatever, they use a, a hot pot to cook while they're driving and, you know, super clever ideas that it's not that we go back and design a hot pot, but it's like, we had no idea that yeah. people were using these surfaces for that. So uh, interaction, interaction and inspiration. Um, and then, of course, like any manufacturer, we're always trying to make it easier for the guys on the factory floor to, uh, put things together and not curse out the designers, which, <laughs> which they do. It's awkward that I'm the CEO and the designer. <laughs> Funny. So, so mostly the curse words go to my, my junior guys, but um, no, I mean, continuous improvement is, is the name of the game always. Uh, so you're sitting in that cricket right now and I'm assuming there's no lights on in there. <clears throat> that is true. And it's very bright. I don't know. I, the the ceiling, or the whatever that's made of, seems to let a lot of light through. Um, well, one of the big changes for twenty one is that we have a new on the outside. It's it's pretty bright orange, um, which is which is actually how we started out. That's a different story, um, and we're getting back to that. So we have a this orange tent fabric. It's really cool. At nighttime, if there are lights on inside, it glows like a lantern on the outside and it's quite oh. beautiful. Um, in the daytime, the sunlight coming through the orange, it's white, the fabric's white on the inside. It makes you look very healthy. I don't know if all like fine dining establishments have lighting that try to make their customers look really good. This, <laughs> this orange on the outside, tent side, I, you don't have to compliment my uh, complexion or anything, but generally. <laughs> You're looking good, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, the quality of light is is quite great, and uh, you know, relative to our size, I, you know, we have that mostly they're not open, but we have sort of twice as many or more windows than anything else our size, because we can put a lot of windows in the tent part, which is great for light and cross ventilation, um, and then we have the the windows in our hard side. So, it really by intent. Uh, it's, I don't, you know, it's the perfect design that uh, that is the hybrid of like feeling like you're outside, but the comfort and security of inside. And, you know, I joke about people having their roof up so they can stand up and watching a bear running towards them and you just pull down the roof and become hard sided and <laughs> make, we haven't devised that as a, a test. We do other tests, but not, not bear tests. <laughs> You, you had mentioned that you've 
uh, be, you know, pre-COVID days that you would go to the shows and talk to customers and things like that. And when I when I look at your line, immediately I think of like rock climbers, kayakers, mountain bikers. Have you ever met somebody that's using one of your products and said, hey, I never thought of our product being used in that sort of way? As, as... Uh, yes. Okay. Could you give us an example? <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you want... I have lots of examples. Some of them are, one of them was super interesting, but it's mildly colorful. Um, but uh, not, well, so no, from people who say, hey, like I am a serious astronomer. I have a oh. telescope that is five feet long. How can I get that in there? And, you know, we, I take my family out in the Rockies and at two in the morning, we're all up and we want to be warm and we love that you have a red light on the inside so our pupils aren't dilating. And we love this. And can we trust your furnace to keep us warm on okay. those, whatever. So cool. Just, and I have customers who are archaeologists who are driving around the sort of wilderness of New Mexico looking for uh, Native American astronomical observatory things. The really colorful one is I've, I don't think he ever ended up getting one, but a, a scientist. Uh, who was studying horse urine. So he was wanted to drive around from different racetrack to different racetrack to figure out the effects of different uh, veterinarian drugs or performance enhancing drugs on thoroughbred horse racing. And could he put a bigger fridge in because he would have urine samples and could he just do this okay. and that? It's like, oh my God, it's like, that is a very specialized customer, yeah. <laughs> very specialized needs. Like, how do you do this? Uh, very early on, I had this wonderful guy who it was wheelchair bound and he loved our trailers, uh, cricket originally, because we have really wide doors. And he, he discovered online that the seat of his wheelchair and uh, the floor of our trailer was the same. Mm -hmm. And so when he went camping with his wife, he wouldn't even raise the roof and he had all these handholds hanging from all our attach points on the ceiling and would hoist himself around. And it was very much like working with an astronaut, talking with Dave and saying, hey, it's because he was like, hey, there's this handheld shower. I, you know, how am I going to wash myself? I'll be on the floor like this and doing this. And how am I going to hoist myself over to here? And so I, again, I'm a designer. That's, that, those questions make me so happy um because i love because it is about fitting your life into our product um and it's not generic at all even if even if you're just a, a family with two kids under five it, you know you are your family and your personalities and your psyches um and so so that's great and i i think i mentioned earlier like just looking at our habitats it's 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 not necessarily easy to just picture that. So we try to take more and more pictures of different lifestyles. And even if we just show one way to outfit a ceiling, the customers can say, oh, you know, for me, I can do better than that. Hmm. And I, then ideally they tell us, it's like, oh, we didn't think of that. But it's also one reason we have habitat specialists um, because it, again, our life, what we're selling is just slightly to the side of the RV industry. And um, so our habitat specialists are there because uh, salespeople out of dealerships don't get into this depth, but it's like our guys are answering the phone. It's like, hey, like I really wanna be solar powered. We go for eight days. We're not just weekend people, but I have a two year old and a, like a CPAP machine or something. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, Ben and Kevin are like, hey, yeah, you'd like I, I know this, I know people like that, or I know this story, or like they are habitat specialists, they use our products. And, you know, Ben's a serious mountain biker and a serious runner, and he's like, I do it this way. You know, tell me if you're an ultra marathon or, you know, so it's, you get different sales questions for our products, I think, more than, uh, the generic white box. I shouldn't say it that way. Then a white box where customers are often, it's like, does it have a microwave? Does it have a full size this? Does it have a that? We're kind of selling performance that is not a, a list of specs, but it's like, you can go be all alone for 
five days before you're even worried about a battery running out in a solar panel. And yes, you can go do this, the, what you said. And yes, we have had customers go to the Arctic Circle. And you know our plumbing tanks aren't insulated, but so you're winter camping, but you're winter camping with a furnace and you're totally warm. It's just that we advise not using your plumbing system. Then. Yeah. So, you know, that's been very effective. You know, we were doing that before COVID, but COVID made that even more, more important because no one was going to dealerships to ask these questions. Yeah. Um, and so that gives us, you know, great insight into, into, you know, more specifics about the people who are calling us. Going, Garrett, going back to the gentleman that was uh, in a wheelchair and was using, you know, the, the, the ceiling and walls and everything to move, maneuver throughout the habitat, I would imagine this must be very durable. Can you talk about some of the materials that you're using to build these then, that he was able to support his weight and maneuver yeah. inside? Um, yeah, we do use durable materials. It, I mean, it's always about, you know, the performance of the material, the durability, the insulation, the ability for us to manufacture. So you're always balancing all those things. But uh, yeah, our exposed structure means that you can see it and you can gauge it. If you're trying to do a chin up on the door frame, you can, <laughs> you know, if you want to add a chin up bar on your door frame, you can see whether there's screw clearance because we also love when people hack our products. But uh, yeah, we, again, it's equipment. It's not supposed to be as cheap as possible. It's supposed to get the job done. Um, and that means, you know, we're not the cheapest thing out there. We're, we're premium in that way, but, but we live up to that. And uh, I don't know if it's the best description. I used to always say that I think of our habitats as like a pair of blue jeans that, uh, you know, they last forever and, you know, they show their experience too. You know, mm -hmm. they wear, they wear in, they don't wear out. Um, and that's what it is, you know, aluminum panels are great for forming and color and the paint will never fade because of the paint we use, but, you know, don't throw rocks at them. Yeah. <laughs> that's not smart. But if you do throw a rock at it or you bump into something, um, you know, it's, it's in my mind, it's not in all our, my customers and minds, but in my mind, it's like, that's your dent. That's when your kid missed the baseball and that, and it's a story and it's, you know, when I was an architect too, I, I like things that that record experience a little bit. Again, not by showing scars, but our cabinetry is not is not uh, laminate with with fiberboard and it. it's it's solid plywood. And yeah, of course you can scratch plywood, but you're never gonna it's not gonna break. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I, I like that wear in, not wear out term. That's really good with the comparison to jeans. I like that. Yeah, and I mean that's like whatever owning a jeep and being terrified the first trail ride you do that you might roll your first Jeep. But, you know, in my mind that the first scratch or the first confidence building thing that, that makes it yours is, is kind of a design philosophy across the board for me. It's like, this thing is yours. Yes, it's a product, but it was designed thinking of a, a really a lot of different ways to slot different people into it. And, uh, I was, when I first started out, I made a student write an essay for me about this. She was, and this, I'm gonna sound very dated. Back in the <laughs> days of, of iPods as opposed to iPhones, it's like everyone buys this beautiful object and then they put their own music in it and then it's theirs. It's no one else's iPod and it's, it's totally distinct. And I think that's a really, since these habitats are containers for life, you know, for the experiences you're having, that's what we really are trying to sell is like go out there and do something different and learn from it and think about it. So it's, it's kind of like that. It's a product yeah. that you fit into and you are you and not, not me. And I like that you use the word hackable too, because when, when I watched your uh, videos on, on your website, I was think you know, um, I was thinking I would hang something differently over here or, you know, I would use those D rings to do, to do this with my stuff versus what, what you were showing in yours. So there's sure. lots of opportunity for really um, creating a personal space from what you've designed. So you've really given a shell with lots of opportunity for, for making it yours. Yeah. 
that's the that's the point yeah because it is yours <laughs> Uh, before before COVID or now or during COVID, I don't know. Do you guys do factory tours? Can people come by and take a look and see how the how the product is being put together? Um, people do do that. Okay. We don't, <laughs> we don't quite advertise it. Uh, no, okay. I love I love giving tours, and we're open to that. We're not we don't have a showroom per se. We are bursting out of our factory now and are heavy in planning to move to a much better space that will have a, a showroom. Um, but yes, we welcome people here uh, and it's exciting and convincing. And uh, the, the Wooly Bear, which is not an RV, we sell directly. So people often come pick it up here. Oh, okay. Um, That's and interesting. It's, again, it's great to, uh, I mean, our RV dealers don't particularly want to sell it because it's, it's our least expensive product, et cetera. And it's, it's more an overlanding product and very few RV dealers make that crossover. Um, so, so yes, we give factory tours, but you want to schedule it. Okay. Again, so, and our, you know, during COVID, our habitat specialists, that's one of their jobs. And whether it's, whether it's saying, Hey, let's do a FaceTime. I will walk outside right now and let's look at that, whatever that space together. Uh, cool. And I'll bring a tape measure and ask me to measure anything you want. Um, and, or people are passing through or they are visiting their nephew and they, make an appointment. So we welcome that, but don't just drop in, make an appointment with a specialist. And g going back to the, to the guts of the, of the habitats real quick, I just yeah. had one question about power. Um, is mostly everything then uh, 12 volt uh, power? So you have a longer time between needing to charge or ha yeah. ha how does the power work inside of these? Uh, I would say it's it's just like any other RV, but a particularly emphasis on 12 volt. So okay. you need you need short power to run an air conditioner. Um, most of our units are sold in places where that's not even an issue. People don't want an air conditioner. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's that's virtually it, unless you know, unless you need your coffee maker from home and you're going to a campground with a power outlet there yeah um no so everything else is 12 volts so we have a, a truma combi furnace hot water heater if you're familiar with that oh yeah um, so propane fire hot water and heat and you know domestic appliances and the 12 volt stuff is lights and water pumps and that and the biggest power draw is if you decide you want a 12 volt refrigerator that's the biggest power draw and generally it's that we provide space for two batteries um, and in a loose way, because it depends on so many things. Um, you know, With one battery, you're good for a weekend running a 12 volt fridge and everything else. With two batteries, you're like four, five, six days. And we're pre-wired for solar panels. So if you want to do that instead of the second battery or ensure that you're doing something or you have some other need that we don't even know about. Um, yeah, I mean, solar panels are cool. I, I use them just because they're cool. It's not usually that I get to go camping for a week or more and, <laughs> and need that extension. Um, so, and we, you know, we use LED lights. We use, we, we are thinking about the, the power draw. But generally it's, you know, charging a laptop or mm -hmm. a phone yep. uh, plus lights on a water pump and maybe a fridge. Yep, perfect. And then yeah. how many how many dealers are what, what how can people find out what dealers closest to them that carries one of these well am i allowed to, our website is taxaoutdoors.com and yeah. we have dealer stuff there you type in your zip code and you'll find the nearest ones oh um, okay we covid put a, a crimp in our ambassador program where lots of our customers were happy to if you weren't near a dealer they would be happy to give you a tour of their product, but oh, that's cool. But that got squished by COVID, um, and then yeah, and so that's the way we we are all around the U.S. and in Canada. Uh, I think we have about thirty dealer locations, slightly mm -hmm. fewer dealers because some of them have more than one location. Um, 
so from British Columbia to, uh, I don't know, to Virginia. Okay. Oh, nice. All around. Um, and so you worked at, um, you were an architect, you were a professor, you worked at NASA. Yes. Uh, you had no, I, just from listening to the conversation, it sounds like you didn't have a lot of uh, business experience. What's been the hardest part in starting and running a company? Um, I like to think that architecture is a business, but it, it's a service industry, which is different than manufacturing. Right. Um, uh, I mean, for me, you know, finding the right team is always right. I'm not, I'm not the numbers person. I'm the designer person. Um, and, and the one at least at the start with the biggest intuition about this, the market that wasn't being well served. Um, manufacturing is a real bear and you can hire that more or less quickly. That's not how I was able to fund the business. So it, you know, I'm much smarter now than I used to be. Um, so uh, getting the right means and methods of manufacturing and just uh, making sure you learn from all the, the stupid things you did. Um, and I, I can give the examples I think of off the top of my head are pretty silly, but you know, the first 20 crickets were all, you know, we used caulk from Home Depot. Um, and then you think, oh, oh, wow. Like we applied that in a hundred degree heat and a hundred degree humidity and Houston, and now it's in the Rockies and it just froze and that that's the wrong cock. <laughs> um, but uh, that's, I mean, any uh, manufacturing is all about constant improvement. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, finding the team is always great. We have a great team right now. Um, it's It's crazy, I don't know, if you've talked to other people about this, like COVID has increased demand amazingly. Uh, yes. And that means, you know, that's, that's its own stress. It's, that doesn't mean the supply chain in any way is, is caught up, but, or it's, it's mostly caught up, but it has weird hiccups. Um, and it's obviously a horrifying thing if a 50 cent part is preventing the shipping of a $30,000 product, something like that. Um, and sometimes with some of our shortages that have never happened before, we, we make cynical assumptions that the big players have reserved all the porta potties or something. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, like, how could you run out of this? It's not even from somewhere far away. Um, but uh, so every day it's, there's some little emergency in a supply chain way. Um, no, it, I, it's really exciting times. We are, I don't know, 40% bigger in our factory now. We had to rent an external parking lot. One of, one of our departments is outside in a tent um, because, I mean, because the public demands it. Yeah. And uh, you sort of feel like you're taking, trying to take care of the uh, public's sanity to get out of whatever city or house Mm -hmm. They've been stuck in for too long. Um, so, but the biggest challenge, I mean, manufacturing in a broad way. Yeah. Architect I mean, I knew how to make things, um, you know, in a conceptual way. I'm a, I'm a rough framer, not a finished carpenter. So getting the right people who are, have the, the complementary brain types to mine um, is, is always the sort of management challenge. And it's, uh, I don't know, and the, the COVID expansion means that whereas it used to be a person was doing one of our departments, now we have a department doing it and uh, figuring all that. So it's all, it's all exciting and it's a lot of hard work. Um, and our customers are sort of enjoyably desperate for our product, but that means they're also tweaked that we can't get it to them right away. But I think everyone in the industry is having that problem to different extents, um, and we're all we're all trying to do that right, because because obviously it's good for business, but but philosophically it's the best for the customers. 
And I know we're, we're taking up a lot of your time, but I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the woolly bear as well, it, because it's so different than the cricket yeah. and the mantis. How, how did the woolly bear model come up? Like, how, how did you decide, you know what, we need something that's a little, we're already different, but now I want to go even more different than everybody else. How did that idea happen? And can you tell us a little bit about the woolly bear and how it is different than, because it's not something that you right. technically would sleep in or live in, but, but if you could just talk a little bit about it. Sure. Um, so the woolly bear is our cargo trailer that can have a rooftop tent on it. So in that way, it's inspired by my experiences over the years with overlanders, people who have crazy cargo trailers with what air suspensions and sort of mill spec stuff. And they are, I mean, the, the brand, that knit word has gotten much more common and cheaper, but 10 years ago, that was really like, let's drive to the tip of South America together. And this is an expedition we're going on. It's not, it's not a trip. Um, so thinking about our family of products and thinking about how our channel opportunities, you know, the, the three bigger units are legally RVs in a legal sense that limits how you can sell them, but particularly ironically in Texas where mm -hmm. Tesla lost its lawsuits about alternate ways of setting up dealerships. Um, so th this was a, you know, a, a test piece where we're both, it's like a starter unit for people who are backpackers but can't quite handle the idea of something that's closer to an RV. Um, and it's my looking at most of these overlanding trailers and saying, you know, they are great, but, but mostly once it, this thing is there, it, you know, you haven't optimized the field kitchen experience. So what's a chuck wagon with a cargo trailer? Mm -hmm. um, and then thinking, you know, at, when I first designed it, was this sort of a few years before it actually came out? It's like, how will a big, will an REI want to use this, sell this? Could we get an outdoor industry store to use this as a store fixture and they can put style their camping stoves and, or pile sweaters on top of it, we didn't, we didn't care. And have that be our exposure mechanism to spread the brand idea um, and be able to, in, in some way, closer to drop ship it straight to a customer, stuff like that. that yeah, I think you guys are really filling uh, a niche that, that there's not a big, I don't, I don't know how I'm trying to say this, you guys really are filling the niche of people that, like you said, don't want to sleep on the ground, but don't want a, a home on wheels. You know, it's really yeah. an, an outdoor experience. And my favorite is the tiger moth, by the way. I like that one. All right. I actually, I actually like this woolly bear a whole lot. <laughs> when I saw it, I thought, <laughs> I'm glad we got to talk about it a little bit because I think it's a very smart design. I, I like how it has the drawer for the cooler, that the cooler goes inside. It's, it has the outdoor kitchen built in. It's got space for your bikes, uh, kayak. You can put bikes and kayak on it. I, I think it's a really smart design. I really like the small footprint of it and that I would imagine it's probably pretty light that almost anything could tow it too. Like I, I I, I looked at this yeah. and I said, I've never seen anything like this. I, I really like the woolly bear. It's my favorite. Um, it's my favorite right now too, though I'm not, I probably shouldn't say that as, as the parent <laughs> of all these things. <laughs> um, yeah, it's my favorite. There are more and more overlanding trailers that are, that are not mill spec that are coming on the market. And that's exciting too. We're still quite different. And uh, back, I've mentioned this, how I always want to take six photo shoots of our product. The woolly bear, we keep illustrating in one way, but you know, that cargo deck on top, you can, you can not have a tent. You could get 10 bikes on there. If you were like a, a day oh. use bike team, you could put the tent up high or down low. You could, you know, run rivers again, not bring a tent and put bigger crossbars on and get a lot of kayaks up there. But it's, it's hard to illustrate that succinctly. That's because it really is, a multi-configurable cargo trailer. Yeah, it looks very um, versatile. Yep. Thank you. So we will definitely put a link to all of your, to your website and to your social media site so people can go in and see how configurable these 
these habitats really are and, and they're really, you can almost do anything you want inside of one of those to make it yours. So we'll definitely put links in our show notes uh, so people can go check that out. That will be greatly appreciated. Um, I've really enjoyed talking with you guys and uh, we'll start listening to your podcast. It's, it's also funny, it's an it's aside, but starting out taxa, I did a lot of driving around the country <laughs> in a guerrilla marketing way, but I'd also, that's when I addicted myself to various podcasts. Um, we'll be glad to have you as a new listener. <laughs> yes, <laughs> cool. All right, well again, thanks, thanks so much. Thank, yeah, thank you, you Gary. Thank you. We really appreciate you coming out and uh, taking the time to talk with us and, and telling us all about Taxa and what you guys are up to. It's it's very unique design, and I encourage everybody to check out the show notes, and we'll have some photos of of, of all your different models. And right. we'll, like Sean said, we'll have some links that they can get right to your website and, and learn even more about you. All right. All right. Take care, you guys. Thanks.